Namaste. Welcome to the Festival of Bharat. My, I'm your host Kamal Madi Shetty, and you're tuned into season four of the Festival of Bharat. We are a platform that believes in having open and frank conversations about Bharat with no holds barred. And today we have a very special guest with us. We have with us Jeffrey Armstrongji, who is also known as Kavindra Rishiji. Jeffrey Ji is an award-winning author of numerous books of Vedic wisdom, including his most recent book. the bhagavad gita comes alive a radical translation uh, jaffri ji has been a philosopher practitioner and teacher of the vedas for over 45 years he has degrees in psychology history comparative religion and literature and has a successful career as an executive in the silicon valley he uh, was a motivational speaker to fortune 500 companies for 10 years before turning to teaching full time rishi ji is also the founder of vasa the vedic academy of science and arts in vancouver Uh, he is co-chairman of the Vedic Friends Association along with Stephen Knapp and David Prolegi uh, and a scholar of British Board of the Dharmic Scholars. Namaste and pranam Jaffrey ji welcome to the festival of Bharat. Pranam's come out great to see you thanks for having me on. Thank you so much Jaffrey ji for joining us. Uh Rishi ji I, I want to begin by asking you if I may uh, about your dharmic journey. Uh, can you tell us what is it about dharma that made you embrace it? I think the first answer I'll give you to that is the direct one. It's from chapter 7 verse 19 of the Bhagavad Gita. Bahunam janmanamante nyanavan mam prapadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudurlabha. After many many births in pursuit of jnana in pursuit of a higher understanding one finally comes to the conclusion vasudeva sarvamiti. So When I was born in Detroit, Michigan, in a white Caucasian middle-class family, nothing particularly bad about them or great about them. They weren't philosophers. They weren't thoughtful. They weren't uh, the kind of stimulating environment where you would get exposed to other cultures, you might say. But lovely people, friendly enough. And so I didn't have a traumatic upbringing. I had a good, healthy upbringing. Military family, third generation. I should have been the next. but didn't want to go to vietnam and kill innocent women and children so i could see right away at a quite young age something was wrong with the world i also could see that i wasn't getting straight answers from my elders from my teachers from my parents and alarms were going off so gradually i became more and more philosophical it was the 60s and so the gurus of india were beginning to now go back out into the world My joke about it is uh first England and the outside powers came in and colonized and took everything robbed the whole place took their jewels took everything but then after they left or after they were finished the gurus of India said wait a minute you forgot the most important thing you forgot the crown jewels you didn't take the vedic knowledge so the gurus started coming west and i was just at the right age in my 20s for them to come to the west i began to hear them and to pay attention to them and finally it led me on an inevitable quest and i joined an ashram in which i stayed for 5 years as a brahmachari and it was the, the my conclusion or you might say that the vedic conclusion became mine with a reawakening of my previous life no doubt So now there I was looking like Nick Nolte but having a Hindu inside I can only tell you mm-hmm. inside there is a real Hindu man or person or atma so that coincidence that strange reversal is now of course you can see hundreds of millions of yogis around the world not from the racial cultural mix of Bharat but in fact from every culture around the world so we know something's happening we know that yogis from bharat are being sent out around the world in skin that doesn't fit their culture but we also know that the same people who were uh colonized have also gone out into the world because they had permission to go move into the countries of their colonizers strangely enough so they've recolonized you know the saying that for 300 years britain colonized india and in 50 years uh in india took it over with uh, 
Indian food. The only good meal you could get in England about 20 years ago was Indian food and Italian. So as I continued in this process, I learned the cooking. I, while in the ashram, I learned all those different things. But more than anything, I did tapasya, real tapasya. And I burned off my ancestral karmas. And so from that time forward, that was 1969, I've been a dedicated Hindu for my entire life without blinking, looking back. I do mantras every day. I've done sadhana every day. I continued as if I was born in the culture and was one of its dedicated uh, uh, carriers and practitioners. So I have lived the Vedic Hindu Dharma every day of my life since I was 23 years old and I'm now 74. I decided there was nothing left I wanted to do but teach it. So at age 50, I quit doing all other activities. I had no money. I had just enough money to pay one month's rent, but I dedicated myself completely to teaching the Vedic knowledge. I said, well, Bhagavan, it's up to you. If you want this to happen, it'll happen. And my partner, Sandy Graham, whom you've been speaking with, joined me in that at that time. And so both of us are yoga practitioners and in the deepest sense, philosophically and lifestyle. Diet, no drugs, no alcohol, no nothing that no good Brahmin would touch. So none of those things. So the lifestyle goes with the philosophy. It's acharya. Yad yada acharya tishveshtas. Tat tad evi taro janaha. Sayad pramanam kurute. Lukas tad anuvartite. Does means nothing unless you walk the talk. So there you go. I'm a dedicated Hindu inside of an unsuspecting Nick Nolte body. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Prishiji. Uh, that was very, very inspiring. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Prishiji, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Dharma and Vedic Vidya, uh, you know, if you have to tell somebody who is uninitiated, you know, can you tell us how the knowledge of Dharma and Vedic Vidya enhances an individual's life? Yes, and you know, Kamal, there's something very important at the root of this. So, because I was born into the culture of being a Christian, and I don't have anything against them. Nobody was ever mean to me, but I didn't think they their story was complete, and it, it was their story that bothered me. Jesus seemed like a very friendly person, but the world was colonized in his name and destroyed in his name. That didn't make sense. His father seemed like a really angry, mean, punishing individual. And you only have one lifetime. Can you go to hell? You can go to hell forever. And that's really not very endearing, you might say. It's a fear-based system. It's a blind faith system. Don't ask questions. Just shut up and do what you're told. And you'll be okay. Well, that just didn't work for me. So the difference with the Dharma culture is that you're supposed to ask questions. You proceed by asking questions. It's called adhikari. To be adhikari means, and this word adhikari, I'll tell you a little linguistics, since that's one of the things I love doing. So adhikari means when you're qualified, the guru will decide that you're qualified for the next step of learning. So adhikari means qualification over many lifetimes. So the most important difference between the Vedic civilization and the Western civilization is that everyone in Western civilization, which is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all the Abrahamics, plus modern science, are trapped in a one lifetime paradigm. They have one tiny lifetime to live. To me, this is the smallest cage or box you could put someone in. It's just, it makes you small-minded. And so we call it in Sanskrit, kudratma, instead of mahatma. So I could see that it was all Kudratma. But the Vedic viewpoint was Mahatma. And the next thing it was, if you read the Gita, is user-friendly. Krishna says, I'm teaching you this, Arjun, because you're my friend. Well, that's not threatening. He's not saying, if you learn this, Arjun, or I'm sending you to burn in hell. He's saying, you're my friend. I, well, I'm here to make friends with you, to reintroduce myself to you. You have many lifetimes. There's no rush, but then again, if you want to do it now, I'm, I'm ready. So sounded pretty user-friendly to me. 
And then the next thing is, and this is the way I like to say it. So the Abrahamics call themselves pretty much people of a book. Okay. Because they have a book and they say, this is our book. Well, that's what religion means. It means really gari bound by a book of rules. That's the literal meaning of religion. So Hindus don't have a religion. So don't ever again call yourself my Hindu religion. That's a complete misuse of the language. Because you don't have a single book. The laws of Manu doesn't make you a Hindu. Does it make you a practitioner of the Vedic Dharma, more correctly, let's say. That's how I like to say it. I don't mind being called Hindu, but I like Vedic Dharma better. The Sanatan Dharma culture. So if that's the case, then, the Vedic Vidya, if they are the people of a book, we must be the people of a library. Now, in order to have a meaningful library, you have to have a language that doesn't degrade over time. And Sanskrit is the only language in our world that is as close to mathematics and a programming language as a language can get, which is based on roots, which has got a grammatical system of Panini with 4,000 grammatical rules, precise rules, whose phonetics is precise. So nothing about Sanskrit is allowed to change over time. So there's no drift of meaning. So this means that Vedic civilization is the only one whose answers are reliable. Because the rest of them, when Shakespeare wrote and when Chaucer wrote poetry in English, those poems a hundred years later were useless. The English had drifted away so far. By 300 years, no one could read them, not even the people in England. So imagine how bad those poets felt. Whereas if you read the Sanskrit right now, it could be 10,000 years old, and you can read it the same today as you would have read it 10,000 years ago. So I began to see these things. I was a literature major, a philosophy minor, a psychology major. And you know, Western psychology is just an accumulation of knowledge from India, for the most part, that was taken. It's important to understand that not only was wealth taken, but there was a, a colonization of knowledge, which Western intellectuals stole, claimed was their own, and claimed it as their discoveries. It was actually called discovering it. It meant if Nobody who was a Christian had printed it or spoken it. You could take it, call it your own, and release it as your theory. So Western civilization is so proud of itself, but in fact, it's an accumulation of stolen theories and objects from the rest of the world for the last three, 400 years, all in the name of Jesus. So I want you to understand that that is crazy. So what is the difference? Well, a Dharma culture, Dri is the root. Now the root of that root of Dri is Ri, the Ritam. So the Ritam is the laws of nature. Originally unwritten, but nature is perviate, permeated by laws. And those laws of nature are what make science. They're what make truth. So a Dharma culture is not a blind faith following of religious rules in a book given by authority. It is, the it is the decision to try to work in harmony with nature, first of all. So Dri is the essence of a thing, which if you take it away, it is no longer itself. That's the definition of the root of the word Dharma. So to follow Dharma is not to follow blindly. It's to follow knowingly that this is a code of nature. If you go against it, you'll get duke. You'll get suffering because it's the laws of nature. It's not like you're being punished, it's just the law. And if you work with it, you get soup. So the next thing to remember is that this is the only philosophy that lets us have time to go and improve ourselves. Not just time in one life, but time over many lives. So back to Adhikari, if Adhikari means your qualification this time, in Greeks, it became edukari, which in Greek meant to bring out what is inside. In English, it's education. Same word from the Sanskrit, just moving to Greek and then to English. But in education, in English means to pile information on top of the person. It doesn't ask, are they qualified? So the English education it's not really Adhikari. It just dumps a bunch of information on you, 
pre-packaged. So it's like frozen food dinners being fed to everybody. It's not quali- It's not designed for your qualification. So the Dharmic culture is a culture where everything is explained to you according to your level of hunger, interest, readiness, and ability and willingness for participation at that level. So this culture evaluated you to see if you were ready at every stage of the process. And we're gonna talk more about that later, I think. But in my case, this also led me to become, I, without becoming first Vedic, I worked my way through college at a metaphysical bookstore called Circle Books in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they had every metaphysical book in English that exists in the English language that's worth reading. And I read all of them. I must have read 2000 books. I was a voracious reader. And I worked at the bookstore so I could read them while I was working there. And I had access to this entire library of all the metaphysical literature of the world, which included the various translations of the Gita, the things that were coming out, the newest gurus that were coming to the West. So as I read and studied all of these things, I began to understand that this library was the repository of more knowledge than any other culture in the world had. So if you just like books like I did, where would you end up? You'd end up in Bharat. And you'd end up asking, well, then how does Vedic Dharma enhance your life? Well, how does working cooperatively with nature enhance your life? Well, first of all, you succeed instead of failing. Second of all, you get less pain. You get more real pleasure and joy because you're cooperating. So you get punya and not pop. Pop doesn't mean sin. Sin is a Christian concept. Pop means pain. It means demerits that lead to dukkha. And suk is because you got punya because you cooperated with the laws of nature. So this brings us to astrology, which means, so I became a Western astrologer first. And then after spending five years in the ashram, I met a Jyotish guru who lived in London, but was from India. His name was M.K. Gandhi. He was Ravi Shankar's astrologer, the Beatles, the Queen and King of England, or the royal family, rather. And he also was a Maharishi's astrologer at the beginning of Maharishi's movement, TM. So he accepted myself and a friend of mine who were both Western astrologers. And I'd already done five years of ashram. So he said, well, you're Adhikari. So I'm just going to teach you the nine mantras to the nine grahas. And I want you to chant each one 100,000 times. So he told us, if you chant 900,000 planetary mantras, I'll teach you Jyotish. So now I'm 28 years old after five years in the ashram. So I spent the next three months, my friend and I did, 12 hours a day chanting mantras. And he then taught us Jyotish. So after being in the ashram, I was a yogi trained, brahmachari. Then I got an, a guru of Jyotish. So now karma was no longer a theory to me. I could see it unfolding in the person's chart. I could see their doshas. I could see their gunas. I could see the grahas opening a chapter for them and giving them a download of particular karmas that they had created. So I became able to see, not in theory, not just believe, but see the unfolding of karmic events that were scheduled from previous lives. So I could go on, but this Dharma is not a theory-based culture. It's theory and practice and science-based culture. And you have a much wider worldview. So you become Mahatma. The point of Dharma Sanatan Dharma and Sva, one's own Dharma, is to make you Mahatma and to give you a big view of many lifetimes and a big view of everyone else. So to me, I think this Namaste culture is the one where I say to you, 
I see that you're an Atma also, and I respect you as an amazing being on a long journey. So last thing I'll say is, I renamed the universe the university. As far as I'm concerned, we're all college students or grade school students, depends on the Adhikari. So if someone's in kindergarten, you don't start teaching them PhD knowledge. And this is why the Vedic civilization does not try to coerce or force people to learn it. We wait until they ask. We wait until they're ready. Because we know that you don't teach a third grader high school knowledge. You don't teach a high schooler college knowledge. And you don't teach a sophomore PhD knowledge. So this is the grace of the Vedic civilization. No coercion, no conversion, just friendly conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Rishiji. That was very insightful. Rishiji, you mentioned, um, you know, in your previous answer a little bit about the differences in, you know, the Vedic worldview and, uh, you know, others. Uh, and you're a scholar of comparative religion. And while Vedic Dharma is not exactly a religion, but, you know, I wanted to ask you uh, if you could go slightly more deeper into the difference between Vedic worldview uh, and the Vedic way of life uh, compared with several other uh, worldviews that we see in the world. All right. That's a really important question, actually. I like to think of it, if, if you will, if, if you, here's the place to start. Five, 10,000 years ago, and for a long, long time uh, after that, and probably before it, the Silk Road was what connected China and the, what we call the far Asian cultures all the way across to India and to Europe. All right, so that Silk Road carried the Sanskrit language across into Europe, all the European languages are filled with Sanskrit, right. especially the ones that took it directly, which is Russia. The word Russia comes from the word Rishi. It's Rishia. Wow. The word Scandinavia is from Skanda, the son of Shiva. Wow. The word Ireland is from Aryan directly. So, all of these European languages are rooted in Sanskrit. And then the Latin-based languages coming out of the Greek, so Greek and then Latin. But Western civilization only cares about Greek and Latin. Yes. And they don't want us to have a long history. Yes. Okay. So that's one of the things about a religion, the three religions and modern science. Modern science, unless they prove it, and they're interested in it. If they were interested, they'd go to India and they'd prove it. Yeah. Even Sanskrit would be proof. But they're not interested and they haven't proved it to themselves. Even though they took astronomy, mathematics, everything from India. The Shushruta Samhita, 600 BC, the Charaka Samhita, so the two ancient medical texts, no one in the West knows about them. Yeah. They think they invented medicine themselves by trial and error. Right. So this historical process that was going on down the Silk Road, chunks of Vedic knowledge, pieces of it, were taken by these different cultures, naturally. Okay. Then persons within those civilizations became influential because of that knowledge the so-called prophets of the various religions, whether it was Mo Mohammed who was sitting, it was a trader along that same route. So he knew thousands of people from India. They were going back and forth all the time. He was talking to them, learning their language, learning their ideas. None of this happened in a vacuum. And the context it happened in was Bharat. So this is the part everyone's left out of the story that Sanskrit and Vedic knowledge and various languages from Bharat were going up and down the Silk Road for thousands of years. The Chinese say they got their medical system from India. Everybody knows that Da Mo brought martial arts from South India to China and Shaolin Kung Fu is from South Indian martial arts. Wow. So if you are in the know it all, you see this knowledge flowing back and forth. Suddenly, Somebody slams the door shut and says, we don't want any more. 
of your knowledge. We have our own now. It's kind of like a, a son growing up in a family, learning from his father and then getting upset that his father knows more than he does and saying to his father, I don't want to hear from you anymore. I'm going to have my own way. But his father is a professor who taught him everything he knows, but he doesn't want to hear about it anymore. So that's what happened with Bharat, with India. The rest of these cultures said, no, 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 no. We're going to make this our own corporation. Mm -hmm. So I call the three Abrahamic religions with no disrespect because clearly they have some truth because they got it from India. First of all, they got it along that silk route. So to say they don't have truth would be absurd as well. Right. But they are a small-minded buying group that is based on blind faith and a small amount of knowledge. Yes. So I call them Costco, Walmart, and Target. Right. Now, if you've ever joined, I, I go to Costco here in Canada. Right. So we get really good prices on really healthy, good food. So why wouldn't I join Costco? Now, if Costco started telling me what to do, I'd have to withdraw. Mm -hmm. So if they became a blind faith religion called Costcoism, now I would have a problem because I'm a thinker and they can't tell me what to think, but they can give me good prices on food. Yes. So every civilization has clubs that cooperate together to make life better. But when that becomes the center that decides what is truth, then you have a problem. So Western civilization is a blind faith buying club yes. that was mostly concerned, ironically, with going out and stealing from everyone else in the world. Now, I'm from America and Canada, so I can say this. When the American politicians say, in God we trust, or God bless America, they mean, I hope God makes us able to go steal things from everybody else. Right. Because that's their history. They stole North America from the First Nations. They displaced thousands of tribes of indigenous people who were taking care of the land, who were brilliant, who were friendly, who would have welcomed them and did welcome them. So Western civilization is a colonizing civilization pretending to be religious. And this is something that needs to be said because the last 300, 400 years of history prove it. Yes. Most people don't know this, but the Pope, the Catholic Pope, a little before Columbus, made a decree called a papal bull. And he said, I want the European powers, especially Spain and Portugal, to go out in the world and discover it. Okay. And he defined discovery as, if it's not owned by Christians, take it, enslave the people, take their land, take their wealth, bring it home, give some to us too at the Catholic Church, and then take over their culture and convert them to Christians. This was the order of the Pope before 1492 when Columbus started discovering. They had maps. They knew of these places. The Chinese had been traveling the world for a long time before. And so had various cultures. In the time of supposed Jesus, 2000 years BC, 150 ships a year were going from India to Rome. Think about it. Did you know that? No. Nobody does. So in that case, do you think any people from India went with the ships? I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. Do you think they would have had warehouses there for the things they were bringing from India? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And do you know what? Sometimes in actually in the, in the Roman Senate of that time, there's an entry that says, We've got to stop spending so much money in India on saris for our women. Okay. Well, it's in the, in the Senate record. Who's not in the Senate record is the existence of Jesus. Nowhere in the Senate record of Rome is there an in mention of Jesus. Okay. But there is a mention of spending too much money on luxuries in India. 
Right. And occasionally the Roman emperor would send a ship full of Italian girls as a special gift to a Maharaj in India. Now, that Maharaj is probably not a really great Hindu, but <laughs> he, he was pretty much in it for the money and the girls as well. But this kind of thing was going on 2000 years ago. Who talks about this? Nobody, because they don't want us to know what was really going on. Yes. That India was this ancient, ancient civilization that had existed for thousands of years before. And that once these younger cultures started getting their own uh, concept of self, they turned against their parent, the culture of India, and said, we don't want to hear from you anymore. We're going to do it our way now. And they became the highway robbers of our planet. And so right up until now, that control that they've been exercising for the last 400 years has been creating the politics of the world. Right. So. Very, very fascinating, um, Rishiji. Um, that makes me think so much and, and like there's so much to think about and go back and uh, read about uh, various, uh, I mean, histories and uh, different aspects of our culture. Uh, Rishiji, your latest book, uh, Gita Comes Alive, is a radical and decolonized translation of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and my first question about it uh, is that, uh, you know, just what makes, thank you so much. That's wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I want to go deeper and ask you That's some more hard questions. Cover. <laughs> right. Just to show you both of them. Yes. Thank That's you. Your question. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I want to ask you um, a number of questions, but my first question about the Bhagavad Gita, you know, is just about the book. I mean, what makes Bhagavad Gita uh, so special? And like, you know, can you tell us the essence uh, of Bhagavad Gita? Well, I would start by saying that the Bhagavad Gita is the essence of Vedic civilization. Okay. It is, you might say, the guidebook, it's the field book, or it's the user's manual for being a Hindu. Because when you have a library, the good news and bad news, the bad news is there's a, many books in there. So there could be arguments over which one to read or which one is best. Whenever you allow biodiversity, you always run the chance that people will have different opinions and form separate groups of interest, right? Yeah, you see people saying, oh, Shiva is better, or oh. Durga is better, or Krishna is better. See, those are separate groups of interest. If they said Shiva is from the Vedas, no one would argue. They'd say, yes, that's right. If they said Brahma is from the Vedas, they'd say, yes, that's right. If they say Vishnu is from the Vedas, they'd say, yes, that's right. But when you have a big library, it's sometimes hard to get somebody who knows the whole library who can agree. And then the people that are listening don't know the whole library, so they can't be certain about the answer being the truth. So let's say the bad news of having a library is that not everybody knows what's going on. The good news is they have a huge library, which is really helpful. And it's knowledge about all different aspects of life. So we have medicine, we have astrology, we have sciences, we have everything. Okay. So now let's ask the question, what role did the Gita play in that? That's what, in a sense, you're asking. So this brings us to the concept where the Gita begins that in the beginning, Krishna says, I spoke this knowledge unto Vivasvan, the deity, the deva, but inside the sun. So that being must live for quite a long time, right? Does the sun last for a long time? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So then this is quite a worldview because he begins chapter, chapter four. He says, you know, first of all, I spoke this knowledge a long time ago and I gave it to Vivasvan, the deity of the sun. He spoke it to Vivasvan, Manu, his son. Manu started mankind. Manu, com mankind comes from the word Manu. We're Manusha. 
and we have manas. So English mankind comes from the Sanskrit manas right. and manu. And so does thumb, by the way. And so the opposable thumb is because we're mankind. Okay. okay. So this knowledge, right at the beginning, Krishna says, so I, first of all, I'm an avatar. I have descended to earth at this particular moment. To give you a, a brief summary of the Veda, because as times go on, it'll get more difficult for people to read the whole library. It'll get more chaotic. It'll get more difficult. So I'm going to give you a short user's manual. Okay. 701 verses. I'm just going to give you the essence mm -hmm. of everything you absolutely need to know. Okay. okay. So that you have a user's manual. So literally, the Gita is the user's manual to the entire Vedic civilization. And if you did not read another book, you wouldn't miss any of the really important parts of who we are if you just had the Gita. Okay. Okay. So that's really important to know. If I said, here's a user's manual and all about 80% of your technical questions will be answered by this user manual. Would you get one? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it applies to everyone with cell phone, computer, anything. Yeah. So that's what the Bhagavad Gita is, first of all. So everyone should realize there's no such thing as a sectarian Bhagavad Gita. But the translation of something to another language presents a different set of problems. Because the Sanskrit is so precise, then this is where the Bhagavad Gita, it is in Sanskrit. So even if it goes into another language in India, if it goes into Telugu, or if it goes into one of the South Indian languages, even deeper down in the South, or if it goes into Bengali instead of into Hindi, then it'll still get a little different shading and coloring by going into those spoken languages, right? Because the reason Sanskrit is not generally a spoken language is that it's so precise. Yes. So we could call it, and that's what it says it is, Samskritam, the perfected language. Right. This language was purposely created divinely and then perfected grammatically by Panini so that the knowledge never drifts at all. Right. But that means Sanskrit is so perfected that it's rigid and the average person won't stay in school long enough to learn all of it because of Adhikari, because not everybody is a scholar, okay? So this means Sanskrit's gotta come with scholars. Right. So if you have a book like the Gita, so what happens if you've been colonized and the colonizing language is very sloppy and doesn't have much rules and is always changing, that would be English. And what happens if we start translating the Sanskrit into English, then two things are going to happen. One is people who want to use English words, who are the colonizers, are going to put their religious words into the Bhagavad Gita in place of the Sanskrit. So that's what happened. Yes. So first, the, the Gita gets filled with these other terms. So we'll come to that in a minute. But now understand that in the Gita, the whole Gita is summarized in chapter 10. So your question was, do I have a concise summary of the Gita? And I started to take you to some of the problems, but we'll get to those. But here's the concise summary according to the Gita. Chapter 10, verses 8, 9, 10 and 11 are considered the nutshell or summary Bhagavad Gita. So if you don't have time, memorize those four verses. Aham sarvasya prabhavo matak sarvam pravartate iti madva bhajanti mam buddha bhava samandita. Next, majchita madgita prana and so on. In English, 
fairly good translation? Bhagavan says, I am the source of everything. From me, the entire creation flows. Knowing this, the wise adore me with all their hearts. Their minds are surrendered unto me. They think about me all the time. And they render service unto me in various ways. Out of compassion for them, I, who am dwelling within their hearts, destroy the darkness born of ignorance with the shining lamp of knowledge. Jnana dipena basvata. So if you don't have time, memorize those four verses. And if you're an English speaker, learn the Sanskrit and the English. And now you have a little mini Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, I'm the source of everything. For me, the entire creation flows. Okay. The wise adore me with all their hearts. Their lives are surrendered unto me. They derive great satisfaction and pleasure talking to one another about me out of compassion for them. I, who live in their heart, have come and am giving them this knowledge and so on. And if they stick with that, then they won't get off track. So technically, that's all you really need to know to not get off center. Thank you, Rishi ji. Uh, that was very insightful, uh, very fascinating uh, insights that you've shared with us. Uh, I want to talk about your book again. And, you know, your, the translation of Gita is an unprecedented one. Uh, because it frees the translation, and you've mentioned this, uh, you know, of uh, colonial words uh, and interpretations that sort of fail to encapsulate, uh, you know, the, the original essence, uh, if I can call it that, of the Gita. Um, can you tell us why this is important? Why a translation like this is important? Yes, that's a, an important question, Kamal, because the world is you might say, waking up to this period of colonization that I spoke about right. and is in recovery in varying degrees. Yes. That doesn't mean that all the chaos that was caused by it has gone away. Right. So for a large and sophisticated culture like Bharat, that recovery yes. is complicated by many things. First of all, by the incursion of Islam into the country because Christianity I just was reading an article, a friend of mine posted that the Christian church is spending hundreds of billions of dollars right now to finish the job of converting India to Christianity. That's just their budget for India. So to think that this is over or that it's not going on in an aggressive way is to misunderstand. I think according to one statistic, uh the budget of the church in India is as high as the Navy, the Indian Navy. Uh, so one can imagine. That's right. And, and just as determined, if not more so, because after all, intrinsically, the Vedic civilization is not colonial. So it's even hard for them to think that way. And this is very importantly related to your question, because what happened in the process of being colonized? And because something that happens for 300 years, 400 years, does it just stop right away? Yeah. The culture of Bharat is used to holding life together in emergency ways, yes. not ways natural to how it would have been if it wasn't under the attack of Islam or under the attack of Christian civilization. But both of those continue as aggressively, more covertly, but just as aggressively as ever. So this is a very important thing to know that those two religions have a political agenda. And we cannot say this of the Judea Judaic culture. It is not a world conquering culture. So Jews have been best friends with India and remain so because they don't have the same colonial agenda, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They sent a convocation of rabbis to India recently that said, we want to thank you because you've always given us shelter, always treated us well. And of course, Bharat would say the same thing back. Well, you've treated us well too. Yeah. You haven't tried to colonize us and take us over. But it, it can also be said that 
the worst possible behavior has come from Islam and Christianity. Violent, destructive, despicable, underhanded, all in the name of something supposedly noble. Yes. But in Bharat, we don't agree with that. We say, look, if it's noble, then you would behave nobly while you were introducing it. Right. You wouldn't behave like such an aggressor and so violently and despicably. Okay. So we have to be candid about these things, these things. Now, this doesn't mean that all Muslims and all Christians hold those attitudes. We all know that's not true. Many of them are just people and they have sincere interest in their religion. So weaponized religion is very different than everyday religion for people who are just humble and regular people. Yes. They wouldn't go do those things. They, they don't daily behave in a violent way with their religion. So we don't want to speak despicably of those religions in their essence. So I call Christianity and Islamanity a form of insanity. It's something that never exists with Bharat, and that's teaching your truth by violence yes. and coercion. But it is very important that we recognize that this is one of the things that is undermining the culture. So now back to the Gita or to any Vedic translation. Mm. When you go to do the translation, if it was a few hundred years back, it all in every place possible, colonizing words from Christianity would be used as translations for Vedic Sanskrit terms. Right? No. So let's do a simple one. Why use Bhagavan instead of God? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Why? Why not just say, after all, God's easier to say hmm. for most people. So why don't we just call Bhagavan God and be done with it and translate Bhagavan God? And the other 10 or 12 names of Krishna. We'll just call them God, all of them, and make it simple. We'll dumb it down. Well, that's what it is, first of all. It's dumbing it down. Secondly, you need to ask, so what does the word God actually mean? Literal meaning, not my meaning that I make up in my head. And what does the word Bhagavan mean? Now, interestingly enough, if you ask most Vedic practitioners at, on the street, what Bhagavan means, they'll tell you God. <laughs> or they might say Supreme Being or something like that. But let's ask first what the word God means. Well, God came into English from German. And German is based in Sanskrit, not Latin. Most people don't know that. So that means Italian and Spanish and Portuguese came from Latin, so they're called Latin languages. But German and Russian and many others came from Sanskrit. Yeah. Well, we haven't been told this, but that's why Hitler used Sanskrit terms to describe his politics in World War II. Yes. When he said we're Aryans and we have the swastika and all that. He used all those words incorrectly. He just stole them and misused them, right? So anyone in India was ashamed <laughs> yes. that those beautiful words were being used in a terrible way. Yes. So just think of the war that's going on as taking place with words. Mm. Okay, so the word God from German was Gutam. Okay. It went to Dutch as Gut, G-U-T, to English as God, G-O-D. But the Sanskrit word it came from is hutam. H-U-T-A-M. Brahma Banam, Brahma Agnau, Brahma Hutam, Samadina. This is from the fifth, fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And it's the Agnihotra Yagya that's being described. 
And when you place the offering into Agni's mouth in the fire, the smoke that comes up is called hutam. Okay. So now that means that the Christian word for the Supreme Being was taken from something they say they hate, which is the pagan fire sacrifice oh. to the supposed many gods, which is a complete misunderstanding of the idea. But that never stopped them before. So that word hutam, which is one small Sanskrit word connected to Bhagavan, right. and the smoke going up from the offering as a thank you to the devas. That's why the yajna says thank you for all these gifts you've given us. Here's our thank you back to you. Right. So we put some food in the fire and say, before I take this, thank you for all these wonderful gifts. Right. And one of the words we say is hutam. So Christianity took that word without even knowing what it meant from the German and the Dutch. And now it's their one almighty word for the Supreme Being. It's the only word they have. So it's illiterate. It's illiterate because you only have one word. Yeah. It's illiterate because it's Sanskrit and they don't even know. Holy smokes. Very fascinating. This is crazy. So let's ask now, what does Bhagavan mean? So we see the contrast between what Bhagavan is supposed to mean to us. And is that the same as Hutam? Mm -hmm. So Bhagavan is to joined meaningful phrases. There are six bhagas, and I won't go into all the Sanskrit and everything, but basically they are roughly translated, not exactly. Beauty, wealth, strength, fame, knowledge, and generosity, or uh, the ability to give up things that are not necessary. Uh, sometimes called, not quite accurately, but renunciation or being going, going without material luxury. So one who has those six qualities, van, one who possesses them, to an unlimited degree, has the six bhagas to the ultimate amount. That being is the source of everything and is the supreme person being individual, reality, and so on. So we, who know better, have allowed that rich, deep word to be replaced by an illiterate, misconstrued Sanskrit word stolen along with everything else by Christianity, made into their one name, so they're very illiterate, for the ultimate supreme being. And now that has replaced Bhagavan in all the Sanskrit translations, Ooh. including the Gita. So there are 20 words like that, that I took out of the Bhagavad Gita, sin, many gods, and so on, Ooh. religion, all these words that are just Christian. I'll tell you a good one, the word to pray. Okay. So it comes from the word precarious. Precarious is when you're about to fall off a cliff and you're very fearful and you're afraid that something's going to happen and you're just all upset and you start calling out, oh, help, 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 help. I'm afraid. Oh. That's praying. Okay. Well, wow. Now, is that the same as chanting Japa? Not at all. Do you feel terrified? Oh, don't hurt me. Oh, mean God, don't punish me. Is that the way we Vedics think when we're doing Japa? Absolutely not. Not at all. We're going, ah, Ram, 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 Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. It's like we're eating this sweet and it's beautiful and delicious and it's reminding us who we are, yeah? yeah. 
Yeah. So should we say we're praying to Bhagavan? No, absolutely not. Never. Yes. No. And praying to God, even worse. Mm -hmm. Because now we replaced all of our words. I'm not doing mantras and shlokas, and I'm not having a conversation, and I'm not calm and happy and satisfied and joyful. And I'm not asking for anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, give me, give me, give me, give me. I'm saying as a, as a yogi, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? How can I serve you? Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. So those are just a couple examples of words that have been poisoning the understanding of the Gita. Yes. And until the Bhagavad Gita comes alive, no one has ever removed those words from the text since colonization began. So I'm an English major, I'm a lit major and a poet. So I'm just using that in Bhagavan's service and the service of the Vedic Dharma. So the next thing is, because a lot of the English words are confusing or don't have a clear meaning, I'll give you a good example. Tell me what the word spiritual means. You're smart, tell me. Uh, the exact I, meaning, exact meaning. At least in everyday life, I think it's used uh, used as a substitute for maybe self-discovery or a, just something where you're more asking questions, questions about existence, asking questions about yourself. At least in the but your language was like this. You were going, it's kind of this, kind of this, kind of this, kind of this. <laughs> you didn't give me a specific definition. Can you try? Um, I think it's, I mean, the word itself has the word spirit. So it has something to do with that, I believe. Right. Um, it's actually, spiritus is the word that you're thinking of. And spiritus means to breathe. Oh, okay. So the word spiritual simply means you're breathing. Oh, okay. So when somebody tells me they're spiritual, I say, well, I'm glad you're breathing. <laughs> yeah. But you haven't told me anything. Yeah. That's why the word is inspire and expire. Inspiration is when you breathe in. Expiration is when you breathe out. Right. Your last breath is when your body expires. It just means air. So you could say it's when you're blowing hot air at someone. That's spiritual. You don't tell them what you really are. It's just a pretend word. In English, it has no meaning. Yeah. Not The way it's used is I'm not religious. I don't follow a religion. I'm spiritual. Yeah. Okay. So oh. it's a negative. It's not a positive. Yes. It's used positively to say, you know, I'm, you know, spiritual. Yeah. But no, we don't know. We're just nodding and pretending because we don't know either. Yeah. And that's how English works. Mm -hmm. The poet Kuldrich said, when you use a word in English, if you don't get a picture, you've used the word wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's the picture with spiritual? A bunch of hippies going, hey, I'm spiritual. Okay. Or somebody saying that's the alternative to religion. Yeah. So all of these meaningless English words are used to translate the very meaningful, precise Sanskrit. Okay. So first I took all of those problem words out. Mm -hmm. And then I left about a hundred Sanskrit words in the text. There's no substitute for Dharma. No substitute for karma. No substitute for atma. Here's a good one. Does soul and atma mean the same thing? I would believe not. <laughs> I think after. <laughs> <laughs> because soul is S-O-L. It's Latin. It means a little sun. Oh, okay. So it's not the same. Okay. Because the sun eventually burns out. Okay. Someday the sun is a planet, material planet. So someday it'll burn out. It's true, it gives light. So in that regard, it's a comparison. So in our body, the Atma acts like a little sun. So it's got a little meaning. But what does Atma mean? Well, Atma gave us the word atomic. Because it meant originally atome in Latin. You can't cut it. You can't burn it. You can't destroy it. You can't change it. 
That was the idea of Adam, but then we cut the Adam. We split it. So then it wasn't the Adam anymore. So Atma means Dehinos min yata dehe komaram yovanam jara tata dehantaras praptir diras tatra namu yate. You can't cut it, burn it. It's like changing clothes. The Atma doesn't change. The Atma is forever. The Atma is, and then there's a whole series of terms for what the Atma is, Sat, Chit, Ananda, Vigraha. It's a facet of Bhagavan. It's part of Brahman. But soul doesn't have any of that. So soul is another dead end street. And therefore you cannot substitute it for Atma because Atma has all of these different levels of meaning. And you've heard of Adam and Eve, right? In the yes. Christian Old Testament, Judaic text. Yes. So what do we call the Atma when it gets into the material world? Jiva Atma. Um, okay. So Eve is Jiva and Adam is Atma. So Adam and Eve is Jiva Atma. Okay. That's where it came from. In the Abrahamic religion, so Abraham and what was his wife? Um, Sarah. Oh, yes. And so who's the creative couple? Brahma and Saraswati. Oh, okay. Wow. So Hebrew comes from Sanskrit. So Abrahamic is actually Brahma. It's Ah Brahma against Brahman, or it's a mispronunciation of Brahman. And Sarah is Saraswati. And the creative couple in the Vedic tradition is Brahma and Saraswati. Bach. So this linguistic mess is what we have been calling a translation. Because we have been colonized. Bharat has been colonized. So I removed all those, straightened out the mess, left a hundred Sanskrit words in the text so that they were the most important ones that conveyed. There's no translation in English for those words. There's no equivalent word. Yeah. Translation means to carry across, so you can get part of their meaning, but there's no word that's a synonym, okay? okay? For the important Sanskrit words, none for karma, none for dharma, none for atma, so on. So all of those words, I have a glossary with about 100 to 150 word definition of those words, it's the first time a Gita has had a lengthy glossary because everybody was thinking word for word translation. So they thought there was an English word that substitutes for the Sanskrit word. Yeah. There's not. So take out all the incorrect Christian terminology, then leave in a hundred Sanskrit words then make the definitions with precise English so that it doesn't create more misunderstanding. Yes. And now that's the cleanest translation of the Gita that has ever been done. And that's radical. So Gita comes alive and there's no purport. So this is the last part. Because in the conversation, Krishna didn't explain himself. Nobody explained him between verses. But if you do, then the book is three inches thick or four inches thick, and it's filled with so much knowledge, you can't read the conversation. Mm. So in this Gita, it's just the conversation. Yeah. It's just you, Arjun, and Bhagavan. Clear English, Sanskrit words left in place that are necessary, no Christian terminology. It's a decolonized, clear, precise, and mixed with Sanskrit meaning, Bhagavad Gita. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's, it's amazing. I mean, the, the kind of insights you've shared with us, and I'm sure uh, uh, viewers are really inspired by that, uh, at least I am, and I would really look forward to reading that and understanding it in, in there. And I think I, I understand the, the title much better now. And the reason why uh, it has to be called Gita comes at night. Um, thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, and I, I actually have another word uh, before I go ahead, uh, which I would want to ask you, and that is the word of idol. 
because we see this all the time, the, the word of idol, um, um, right? So we, we talk about idol worship, uh, the media, you know, uh, be it the Western media or Indian media, um, it's always used, it's, all, it's used in, in general um, usage as well. Uh, but it's not, I believe, uh, really the accurate word. In fact, it sort of distorts so many things. So could you tell us about this word idol and why is it problematic? Yes, well, this one is full of irony, very much. So first of all, you'll notice that the people accusing us of having idols, their idols are actors and actresses in Hollywood. Yeah. We call that a pop idol. Yes. So obviously an idol is somebody that you want to be like. Okay. So the word comes from ideal and idea and that comes from the Latin, videa, and videa comes from the Sanskrit Veda. And the word Veda means that which allows you to see. And it gave us the English word video. Isn't that interesting? Yes. So far? So now, Ideals are something that another thing in nature is based upon. So all of us in a human body are theme and variation of humans. So you could say there must be an ideal human that we all sort of resemble. Similarly, we have ideas. We all have ideas. What if I said to you, Take a hammer and smash all your ideas. Mm. Would you do that? Mm. Break them all so they all are in pits and pieces on the ground? No. That, you did. Could you speak? Could you act? Could you talk? Could you do anything? Because mm. you have no more ideas. So what I say is if it's your idea to go break idols, yeah. you should start with your own head and break your head because your head's full of idols. So the people who want to crush idols are idol worshipers. They're not really worshipers. So worship means what's worth the most. The word worship comes from worth. Okay, so does the Vedas say that the devas are the ultimate reality? Do they say that everything comes from the devas? Does Krishna say that? No. He says, I put these devas in charge of departments within the material world. Yeah. Each So Vayu is wind, Vayu is not Agni. Yeah. So no one would say Vayu is the supreme being. Yeah. Yes. By the way, supreme in English is Suprema, a thousand times better divine love. Yeah. See, it's a hidden Sanskrit word. Yeah. Doctor is Duktara. Yeah. Somebody who relieves you and he restores and heals, Tara, your Duke. Yes. So all of this Sanskrit is hidden in English. So again, the irony is the Christians say we are idol worshipers. So we should respond, well, and you have a lot of dumb ideas. And if you would smash our idols, which they've done throughout history, them and the Muslims, the violent Muslims, the violent Christians, once again, to be true. Not the friendly Christians, not the friendly Muslims, but the violent ones have gone out and smashed statues. But a statue is just a photograph of an idea or image that you're trying to point to. You know it's not literal. You know it's not exactly what you're pointing to. It's an ideal. Vayu is an ideal. There's an intelligence behind air and wind. Akne is an ideal. There's a being, a personality. There's specific laws of nature behind fire. Are any of those the complete source of everything? No. No Hindu would ever say the devas, each deva, a deva, Indra is the source of everything. Vayu is the source of everything. Yet, to know those as beings is not absurd 
they are beings. They're a group of laws of nature operating in a certain way. And to know them is to be able to cooperate with them. So, right? so when we do pranayama, we're talking to Vayu, aren't we? Yes. And Vayu is carrying prana, isn't it? And prana is an energy source that we need, just like water and food. So there's a way to breathe and get more prana. Yeah. So that conversation with Vayu, am I saying he's everything? No. no. I'm saying I'm talking to the air department and the prana department, prana through air. I want to understand you better. I want to know your ideas. In that sense, our idols in the Vedic civilization are devas. Whereas in the Western world, there are humans in movies. But the name for those movies is video, taken from our Sanskrit, Veda. So the English world is speaking Sanskrit all the time while they're trying to ignore the Sanskrit philosophy. It's ironic, isn't it? It is. So this is my mission. I'm trying to reveal Sanskrit is the mother language to show that we're speaking Sanskrit all the time in English and don't know because we're ignorant and we've been kept ignorant. It's not a problem in the people. They're not insincere. They've been educated in an ignorant way so they don't know the roots of their culture in Sanskrit. It's time for this to come out. And it's time for the Hindu community to catch on to this and stop using Christian words to describe their culture. You don't have a religion. You aren't praying. All the, You don't have idols. You have ideals. And so the more literate this becomes, then you'll be able to start explaining yourself. And this is why the Hindu community, and this is very critical right now, the Hindu youth in the modern world are losing their traditions because no one has taught them how to explain them correctly, so they get embarrassed. Their parents, very sincere, but they don't speak English well. So they can't do it. So the next generation of Hindus, from those in junior high and grade school right now, right on up to those like yourself, who are at the perfect stage to adjust your language and adjust how you speak so that you speak for your culture. You want to, but you haven't learned how to speak for it in English. That's the next training. And I hope to travel with that and do seminars and make that available to the Hindu community so that a renaissance of reprogramming, because if you have a computer, you can't reprogram it without the right language. So I would put forward to you that the biggest obstacle to the Vedic knowledge correctly spreading throughout the world right now is that we don't know how to say it correctly with Sanskrit and correct English. And that's the thesis. Absolutely, uh, Rishiji. Uh, that is not only insightful, but also very inspiring. And I'm sure um, there is there is so much that we have to really go back and read and uh, know so many things which we haven't been told, like you said, um, because of the way uh, we have been educated. Um, uh, Rishiji, I want to shift focus slightly now and you know talk about you know something that we talked about in the beginning and some. Uh, that is the big picture, you know, of regarding Vedic culture. Uh, I mean, it has a like we've spoken so much about the rich heritage and the living traditions um, that continue to enhance people's lives. Um, if we were to look at it from a global perspective, um, can you tell us how it can contribute, uh, you know, towards making the world uh, a better place? You know, Kamal, this. I come back to this, this is not praying. In the Vedic civilization, this does not mean I'm praying. It doesn't mean I'm afraid. And it doesn't mean I'm asking for something. This does. You shouldn't go dehi, dehi, dehi. That's rude. If I met you and you were wealthy and the first thing I said was, give me money, give me money, give me money. You wouldn't think I was very good material to become a friend. You'd think I was pretty desperate and ignorant and 
you might throw me a little bit of money, but you wouldn't think, yeah, that's going to be my new best friend. You see? So a give me, give me, give me relationship to the divine is not a very intelligent relationship. But what if we are all immortal beings who cannot die? That we have two choices while we're in a body. We could fall over this way to the right or this way to the left. We have a creative department and we have a recycling department. You know, in India, if you hand someone food with your left hand, what's the problem? What is it? I think, I mean, it's just something that is not encouraged. Well, if you think if you're living in nature, if you don't know which hand you eat with and which one you clean your butt with, <laughs> then you're confused. Yes, yes, yes. You wouldn't want to go to the toilet and with the same hand start grabbing dinner. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very intelligent. Yeah. We know that as the left hand is used for cleaning yes. and the right hand is used for eating. Mm -hmm. And if somebody hands you food with their right hand, you might accept it. If they do it with their left hand, you'd say, sorry, I had lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. So what if both of these are necessary, but they're unbalanced? Wow. If I talk to you this way, the whole show, that's <laughs> unbalanced. Yes. If I talk to you this way, that's unbalanced. Mm. This is Vishnu and Lakshmi. Okay. This is Vishnu, health, Lakshmi, well-being, not money, whatever provides you well-being, food, shelter, clothing, med medical help, whatever it is, education, things that give you well-being and give you balance is Vishnu and Lakshmi. So the Vedic Sanatana Dharma culture is a culture trying to stay in balance, number one. So that's part of what this means. The second is na, ma, te. Not me, you. Na, ma, te. That's one of its meanings. So it's a moment that's not about me, it's about you. I'm acknowledging you as an adventuresome, amazing divine being who's on this long journey into the material world all by yourself, just like I am. And I'm looking at you and saying, I see how great you are. I see that you're an immortal being too. And my wish is that we stay in harmony with each other. This is the namaste culture. Okay. So in some civilizations, there's a handshake. In the black culture, it's high five, low five. Yeah. I was born in Detroit, so I had a lot of friends who were black. And this was a way to say hello, high five, low five. So I call this high 10, low 10. Mm -hmm. This means I see you as an Atma. I see that you chose to be on this long journey like I did. I respect you immensely for that. I will not violate your space or your individuality. I acknowledge that you're worthy of respect. I'm not looking at your clothing, your skin color, your gender, none of that. Just the real you, the Atma inside, the conscious spark of immortal reality. And I am showing you respect. Now, I guarantee you that if the whole world started doing that all day long, that every time they had a quarrel, they'd come back to that person and say, sorry about that, I lost my temper. I, I respect you. They would start correcting themselves. They wouldn't hate people. They, we wouldn't have to explain that Black Lives Matter. Imagine there was a television commercial and it said black cars are okay. Yeah. You'd say, what a stupid thing to, to make a commercial about. Yeah. If I like a black car, I'll get one. If I like a red car, I'll get one. If I like a white car, I'll get one. But the cars are fine, black, white, red. So if cars are fine that way, why aren't people that way? Yeah. Why are we so foolish as to look at people with different markings and hood ornaments and kinds of skin 
and say, I hate you, I think. That's so unintelligent. Yeah. Haven't you spoken to them? Didn't you see that there's a being inside there? Yeah. So I would like to say to you that really coming in from the outside, this is the one thing the world is missing. Yeah. I don't care how they find their way back <coughs> to where they came from originally. That's their journey. But if we all just start respecting, not just humans, all the animals, everything that exists is an atma, all of it deserves our pronouns. Yes. So in a namaste culture, 80% of our problems would be solved. We couldn't colonize. We wouldn't like fighting wars. We would hate killing civilians. So I don't call the Mahabharata war story because they, they weren't killing civilians. They weren't bombing cities like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Did you know that President Truman in the United States said, I hope God is pleased with us for dropping these bombs on Japan. He actually said that out loud. So are you suggesting that all the Japanese are some kind of animal or insect or something? And that God doesn't care about them at all, but just cares about you and you exterminating hundreds of thousands of innocent people is going to get the approval of the, the being who is their source. Can you think of anything more absurd? That is, but that's what he said. It's a, it's a historical quote. So God bless America while we bomb innocent women and children. Really? What about namaste? What about that as the basis of culture? So just saying hello in the Vedic civilization to me solves at least half the problems. And therefore it answers the other questions about, do we have a caste system? And do we have these things that make other people despicable because of their birth or their skin color, whether from the North or the South? And the answer is no, not if you're halfway educated. Not if you look at someone and say namaste. So then how can you have a lesser concept of them than that? So to me, because I was missing this vitamin when I was born, I, I think you could say coming in from the outside showed me how truly important this one is. And I'll just add with one more thing, you know, the handshake in Western civilization? Yeah. I bet you don't know where that started from. Hmm. Well, so when two persons were walking down a trail in ancient times, the trail's pretty narrow. And if they have weapons, they have a sword and a dagger. Okay. So to show that they weren't going to fight, they would hold out their sword hand, their right hand, okay. and grasp the other person's sword hand. Okay. Then they would put their left hand on my wrist and I would put my left hand on their right. wrist. Yeah. So now we're holding each other's hands. Yeah. So we can't grab our dagger or our sword. Yeah. Then we would turn around on the trail because we're going to go past each other. So now we've gone past each other. Then we would release our hands and back up three feet okay. and continue walking. Oh, okay. So the Western handshake is so I don't stab you. Yeah. Namaste is so that I see who you really are. Absolutely. So that tells you the difference. Absolutely. Uh, you see, the, that's really beautiful. Uh, and I think something that, that can change so many things, like you said. Um, Rishiji, uh, you know, I want to ask you about something that we see, uh, you know, in India particularly, but also sometimes in the, in the way West and the Western media uh, looks at India. And that is, you know, despite the beauty and the profoundness of our culture. Uh, there are many sections, like I said, in, the, in India and in the West uh, that are adamant on you know, branding any cultural or civilizational resurgence uh, of Bharat as some kind of uh, belligerent uh, you know, Hindu nationalism uh, without really um, understanding what, what they're talking about. Uh, you know, can, you, can you share your perspective on that? Well, of course, we live in a world of advertising, don't we? Yes. So the first thing to understand is that that was the extension of 
the corporations that are doing the advertising were the companies that stole everything around the world. So the East India Company, as it was called, the Canadian companies, all were for the same thing. It was to steal the property of the culture. So our modern corporations have one agenda and that's to make money for the shareholders. So we have a CEO and a CFO and we're missing one person inside corporations. And I call that one the CCO, the chief conscience officer. So a corporation is an organization to get profit without a conscience, with no guarantee that what it's doing is helpful or useful for human beings or animals or anyone else. So corporations are simply a group of people, greedy people taking whatever they can get. Now, not all of them behave that way because some people behave better. But it's important to understand that this is the basis of Western civilization. And that even its religions were turned to the service of doing that. So this problem of being just for profit, of just taking and not giving back mm. is the difference between the Vedic civilization and the Western civilization. But because profit only is the basis of corporations, the word advertising is actually a kind of magic that you do. Where I show you a commercial and the commercial forces you, kind of hypnotizes you so you'll come and buy our product. Yeah. It's not an argument for the truth of our product. It's a kind of magic that's used that you will buy our product. Yeah. So it shows a happy couple with their children in a car, and they're laughing and talking, and it's just 10 seconds. And then it shows you the car from behind, and it says Toyota. Yeah. Now, that's an advertisement. The message is spend your money on this car. It'll make you happy. It'll make you happy with your children and your family. So that lie is a secret trick of controlling the mind through this science of advertising. You hear the word advertisement? So what is yoga? Yogas, chit, vritti, nirodha. Oh. Removing the vrittis. The vrittis are the twisted parts of us that have been twisted by being in the material world oh. and are keeping us from knowing who we really are and for working cooperatively with the laws of nature. So, Yoga removes the effect of advertising. Same word, the English word advertisement, the vert is vritti. It's twisting you till you buy our product. So this is the problem, right? You see? That, that explains a lot. Wow. Because, yes, these vrittis and this way of life, which is based around making vrittis, yeah. is a culture of lying yeah. and pretending and facade and advertising. So all of it is to get selfish profit. Mm. And that's the final goal and purpose of everything, okay? Now, religion tolerates that because they also are being coercive and 
du duplicitous. Yeah. They're pretending to be like Jesus. And on a bad day, they go out and try to ruin your civilization, steal everything from you. So back to your question. Then speaking badly of your culture mm -hmm. and making up bad stories about you that are lies and untruthful mm -hmm. and promoting those as the truth mm -hmm. is the way that that is done. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a term for that in linguistics. It's called framing. Okay. So framing is when I say, well, so you're from that uncivilized, uh, recently naked, illiterate culture that believes in many gods and has idols, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. So I just framed you in about four different ways. Mm -hmm. The gun is now pointing at you to prove that you're not those things. Mm -hmm. yes. So here's the rule. If you say those things are not true, the frame only gets tighter because you didn't refute them. You denied them. When Richard Nixon, the president of the United States, was being impeached, he was being accused of being a criminal. Oh. And he got the microphone and he one day very famously said, I am not a crook. Oh. So the frame was he was a crooked president. He mm -hmm. tightened the frame by denying it. Okay. okay. So the same reason that I've changed the Gita, cool. the Hindu civilization, the Vedic culture of Bharat has not learned how to use language to remove the frames that have been put around them. Okay. Yeah. You can only do it by the correct use of language. You can't go and get all excited and get upset. I am from Bengal and I'm very upset with what you are saying. And his emotions are out of control. He doesn't sound rational and he's reacting. Yes. Does the frame get tighter yes. or get removed? That's not good, yeah. He's proving your point. Yeah. There's an old saying, never argue with a fool because the people watching won't know the difference between you. Yeah. Okay. So this means if you don't learn how to reframe the situation. So a reframe would be, who are you to criticize us? You're the civilization that has all of our wealth in your museums and libraries and who spent the last 300 years taking everything we had and millions of our civilization co-contributed to your well-being in the last two wars and did so many things that no one even talks about or recognizes. You robbed and stole from the First Nations cultures where you moved in, and you still lie to them, and you haven't given them justice still. And you're trying to criticize us? That's a reframe. Yeah. Now I'm pointing at them. And next I would say, and we would rather see you as the Atma, We'd rather see you as divine beings. We know there's a divine being in there somewhere, but it's obviously lost. Mm -hmm. So we want to invite your divine being to come back. So this is the namaste culture. Yes. Let's cooperate together. So now we're going to make our pitch. Let's cooperate together for the good of all living beings on the planet to live on Mata Bhumi, Mother Earth, in such a way that there's a future for our children and all the species. Let's use our technological minds to figure out how we can all benefit and not see each other as our skin color or our gender or any limitation, even our politics. Let's see each other as sacred divine beings, all who should be respected. Let's conduct the conversation that way and not to make enemies of each other and eventually destroy innocent women, children, elderly in horrible wars against the innocent. Okay, so that was just a small reframe. But I packed it with some of the necessary information, yes. the consequence of the wrong attitude. So we of the Vedic culture are inviting you 
to see everyone as the consciousness animating their vehicle, their body, and to show every living entity respect and to foster its well being because they all have a right to be here. Now, how can we cooperate with each other and the laws of nature? So let's change democracy to darmocracy. See what I just did? Yeah. Democracy, it looks like the two parties hate each other. It appears not to be working. Yeah. So let's have a darmocracy, a namaste culture. This is what the Vedic culture needs to teach to every one of their <coughs> representatives. The entrance into politics and the ability to be correctly political on behalf of Bharat requires this sophistication in speaking and reframing. Without it, your reaction to what people say, which is the negative commercial about you, yeah. proves that you don't have the correct answer. Okay. And you don't even know what just happened. Yeah. So I would suggest that from top to bottom, the culture of India, starting with Narendra Modi, his people, all the way down, have to become very linguistically aware with precise use of words that everyone agrees upon. When I was in business, I used to make a living partly as a consultant to corporations. When someone would start a new corporation, I would say, you need to make a dictionary of words for your product. And everyone in your company needs to use those words so that they don't make up stories about the product from themselves, but they all describe the product the same way. So there's a saying, if you throw stones in the water, if they all land in the same place, none of the ripples collide. So what you see right now with, with Bharat is a babble of voices not knowing how to speak in English who are being manipulated by people who do know how to speak in English. Mm -hmm. And this we need to change. Absolutely, uh, uh, Rishi Ji, that was, uh, thank you so much for sharing all of that wisdom with us. Um, it has been a extremely en enriching uh, conversation with you. And uh, we are very grateful to have you on our platform. Uh, and there is so much uh, that our viewers are taking away from this. Uh, and uh, thank you for inspiring us to uh, decolonize our minds, our decolonize our language, uh, and telling us, uh, you know, the importance of all of these different uh, things. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rishiji and Pranam. Thank you, Kamal, for the wonderful service that you're rendering and for all of the inquisitive and brilliant and the idealistic people that you represent. You know, uh, it is a saying in the Sanskrit, which I'm very fond of, especially if you're trying to be of service to Bhagavan. And it is dasa 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 nu dasa. I want to be the servant of the servant of the servant of Bhagavan. Three times removed. So when I received this sacred wisdom, this great gift into my life, because I was without it when I was born. There's a famous mantra, you know this one, Oma Gana, Timirandasya, Ganan Gana, Salakaya, Chakshur. If you see something useful or in any way brilliant in me, believe me, I did not have it until I met the gurus and rishis and sadhus of India, of Bharat. And I am now just trying to repay my endless debt to them by being of some service to the Vedic community. And that is what my gurus taught that when you finally contact Bhagavan, your every desire is fulfilled. You no longer chase illusory desires and call that your life. You no longer see each other in a despicable way. So you become Shanti. And in that Shanti, that true place of balance, how can you repay that? By simply trying to be of service and do some seva real sacred seva. So thank you 
for doing what you're doing and giving me the opportunity to be of service and repay my debt to the Vedic community and culture and to its sadhus and gurus. So pranams, pranams. Pranams, uh, Rishiji. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, to our viewers, I would like to request you, uh, please continue uh, supporting us and please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't uh, and both of our channels at the Festival of Bharat and Chitty Media because we will be uploading content on both of them. Uh, we will be back with another uh, inspiring uh, conversation. Um, until then, take care and namaste. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.